evening, everyone. Welcome to my home. I think it's great Friday evening. That's all this um, you guys here. You choose to spend the time with education. I think that's wonderful. I'm very proud of every one of you guys. And thank you for giving me a chance to share with you my experience and my research. Thank you. So uh, it's my sincere hope that the next 10 hours that we're going to spend together. I'm just joking. <laughs> The next two hours is going to be beneficial for you guys. And I try as much as possible to make it practical that you guys can practice those small tips and first right on Tuesdays. Please feel free to ask me any question. And without further ado, let's get started. I think this is where my journey started. And what I want to talk about today, some scientific basis for how I try to practice and here's in my small home, and how we can use evidence-based dentistry and dental implantology. Then I'm gonna try to talk about soft tissue healing. I'm gonna introduce the concept of soft tissue integration, and then I'm gonna try to share some of the clinical cases. How I used to practice and how I try to practice now. And I think this is a great time to be uh, in dentistry. What we can do is amazing now. It's really wonderful. I just, six years ago I used to do my myself for my patients in the lab, having my coffee, having my music, my lectures on, and I sometimes was wondering, I wish if my patient with me, so I can see how is that myself will look on my patient. But today in the digital world, it's amazing. We can scan the patient's mouth, I can do the, my work stuff on the patient, even I can manage occlusion. I think that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Then I can take the same result in the patient's mouth and make the treatment more predictable. So I kind of struggle understanding what's going on with dental implant. Um, I took, I don't know how many courses. There's no course in North America that I didn't take try to understand um, how we can um, restore successfully. Is it the dental implant? What kind of implant that we choose and buy? Is the most expensive implant? Is the best implant? Is that how we're going to determine the best outcome for our patient? So we know soft tissues, um, healing, everything starts with soft tissue healing. So what we do with the body we make incision, right? Crystal incision, or we extract the tube. Now we want to place implant. Okay. Now, the body does not know what dental implant is, right? But what we know that the epitheliums, wanna, and the skin is the first line to first, we want to close the body as soon as possible, right? We want to stop hemorrhage, and we want to prevent any microorganism or foreign body to enter, uh, foreign um, material to enter the body. So every, everything starts with hemostasis and fibrin clot. After that, we know from research, especially on the animals, from Sikiyos et al. and Charhoudi, 1992, that the connective tissue seem to play important roles in how the epithelium stop down the growth. Okay? Because we don't want the skin to grow around the implant and reject the implant out, right? So we want to, for the implant to be successful and integrate. So we want that implant to stay in, and we want some type of interaction between the soft tissue and the implant or titanium oxide, or zirconium oxide, if you will. Now Bertalier also published 1991, and he concluded that the interaction between connective tissue and titanium oxide further stop epithelial downgrowth. So we want that relationship between the connective tissue and our titanium surface. We don't want the body to close and reject our implant outside. So this is what's important for me to understand what's happened, because the body doesn't care if you place implant or not. The body wanna heal, wanna close that socket. Okay. So what we do as a dentist, as a surgeon, as a restorative and dental team, we want to help the body do what's do best. 
heal well. Very simple. Everything is about the biological response of the tissue. It's not us. You know, we, I work very hard on some cases, and I'm not happy with the, how the end will look like. And sometimes I just I do normal work, and the result is amazing. So what's the difference? What I, what I did difference here? Many times it's just the body response. So let's step back and go to the basic wound healing. We know there's four phases of wound healing: hemostasis, <coughs> inflammatory, proliferation, and maturation. So the maturation is, is the end game, right? We want the tissue to mature and heal around the time. And hemostasis is going to happen unless our patient has some medical disorders, right? So it's, the bleeding is going to stop. Okay? The inflammations. It's going to happen. What's important for us is to help the body heal and move from phase to the next phase. Very simply. So I think one of the important factors that I want to share here, especially for dental team, I think they are they could be great help in supporting your dentist um, and your patient. Okay? So if you want to move to healing and maturation, we want plaque control. <coughs> this is prerequisite. We cannot move from inflammatory phase to proliferation unless we have a plaque control. And I really think that the patient needs to hear it more than just from the dentist. It's need to hear it from you guys. You can help your dentist, your patient, heal better, but simple oral hygiene instruction. So I want to share one of my patients, Angie. She's wonderful, always great hygiene. Okay. We did a connective tissue tunnel technique. And I thought, like, wow, this is going to be an amazing result because that's very thick. This tissue here is very thick, very nice. Not every patient can give me from the palate this thickness. Okay. But you can see the plaque. So the patient's attitude is very important because they don't want to touch it. Because if they touch it, it's going to hurt. And the natural response, I just don't want to touch it. I don't want to mess it up for you, dentist. Right? So you can see the redness, and we still have inflammation. Are we going to be successful here? No, we won't. So just follow up with simple or hygiene instruction. It's very profound and powerful, especially from dental team, because you guys can be great support for your dentists. And you can be part of the success of the treatment, and you can stand tall and proud and say, you know, I, you know my patient's successful too because of the work of the team. So we know about the maturation six to eight weeks, and I'm gonna revisit this for soft tissue because sometimes my patient, and I'll show you one of the cases, take for complete maturation sometime a whole year. So we, we have to be careful. Remember, we don't do anything, which is allow healing, and we guide the body. So I think of us as a very humble. Um, we cannot do a lot. We just, if we are smart, we can help the body heal well. That's what we can do. And we can do that well, though. So the bones set the tone, and soft tissue is the issue. right? We, we know it's important. We cannot get a good crystal bone and save the bone without having a good tissue. We cannot have a good tissue without a good bone. Okay. So I'm going to leave a lot of these here is for you. When to use chlorhexidine? Is it something good to use on a patient? When in doubt and you have a problem with the plaque control of the patient, by all means, it's all about risk benefit analysis for the patient. What the dentist can decide with the patient and what you guys as the dental team can do to support your dentist and patient. <coughs> so let's talk about soft tissue. Because that's where's my passion, I think that's where's my research. So we know from CAN, published 2005, that's thick biotype, less buckle tissue recession. Okay. That's the main problem that we have. Patient come 
to my practice for second opinion with the hisses on the facials or the gray of the implant showing through. What's happened? We got to understand what's going on, right? So what I tell the patients when they come, please talk with your dentist. Go back to your dentist and speak with them and share your concern. You share a lot of concern with me. I ask them, did you tell your dentist this? Did you tell them your dentist that you are concerned about that gray area? No, I didn't. Well, dentists and dental team, we are not magicians. We cannot read mind, right? We need that trust from the patient. We need to allow that environment for the patient to talk. And if the patient is not talking with, the, with us dentists, we need, they might talk to you guys, dental team. And then this is, it's important. This is not time to gossip. This is time to, to go and speak with your dentist. And tell them it's my patient's concern. What we can do, doctors? What the reason? So, okay, great. Thick biotype. We all love thick biotype. So let's try to understand. We had a study here by Berglund, published 1961. This is a very important study. I think it changed how we think about dental implant. If you look at the left pictures, okay, on the left side of the implant, you can see that connective tissue is four millimeters thickness. Okay. If you see on second study surgery, same side on the right picture, we don't have any crystal ball loss. Okay. So the tissue is the issue here. We have more thickness of tissue, no ball loss. On the right side of the left picture, thin tissue, two millimeters. On the right hand side, crystal ball loss. I remember taking courses 10 years ago about dental implant. I've been told this is normal. The first years up to 145 millimeters of crystal bone loss, then 0 0.20 every year after. Okay. So if I'm placing the implant on a young gal, she is 18 years old, by the time she is 70, the implant will fall off. We're gonna keep getting more, and that's normal. I struggle with that. But we know that's not the case anymore. We have a better understanding. So is the tissue thickness is important? You bet it is. So think about when we, when we are in the aesthetic zone and we don't want our patient, young patient with big smile lines, they smile all the time, they're very happy people. And then they smile. Do you want that gray? Is it the surgeon problem? or the restorative dentist problem. Or you know what, let's turn our back, it's the patient's problem. Right. That, so are we gonna manage this after this has happened? Or we wanna have the understanding of true mismatch? So you want a mismatch. And there's also extreme mismatch too, where you get a very narrow neck. And I'll show you in the pictures coming out. Another study here is Lagola. This is a randomized control study, high level of evidence. Three years follow up, not too bad. Okay. Again, mismatch and then restored on a bone level and, and matching on a soft tissue level. They found significant difference between the tissue level, which matching platform, versus no significant change in the crystal bone on the mismatch on a three years follow up. And that just been published, 2019, okay? So this is an example about, you know, kind of extreme mismatch. <clears throat> you get a great result, but you got to be worried about this big crown and the crucial load. And this is, th I know this implant, I've been trained on this implant in Frankfurt. This is a conical connection implant, but you don't get a screw loosening on those you get implant fractures and abutment fractures. So when you have more uh, mismatch, you worry about abutment fractures and implant fractures. Um, when you have narrow mismatch, you're not gonna get really the benefit of the mismatch or the platform switching. So this, I'm sure you guys are aware of this implant, this is ankylose. So another study here is uh, by Ken again, 2010. 
he measured the thickness of soft tissue in the aesthetic zone. That's very important, right? You know, I, I have tons of patients, they want to store the anterior implant, they want to place implant in the anterior, they cannot go about without a tooth in the front, but they are okay with having one tooth missing. And the aesthetic demand much more higher than the aesthetic zone, right? But also, you know, well, if we are lucky, we have around one millimeters plus minus. That's not a lot of tissue in the aesthetic zone. So does that mean that we need to do some type of tissue conversion? Do we need to do some type of procedure to thicken in the tissue? Do we need to do? Yes, thank you. And also, I, I, what I like about this study is that we have objective tools, which is called periodontal probe. We have it in every dental office that we can place it on the gingiva, and we can, if we can see through, we know we have some type of tissue, um, thick, thin uh, tissue type. So that's a great, because every office has this type of instrument. And if you're, please don't mind here. Can we get that chair? Oh, here we go. So we're talking about how is um, dental office, we have a great tools in the practice called periodontal pro. Who's the hygienist here? Great, we have three hygienists. This is great tools you have it in your practice. Good. Can you live without periodontal pro? No. Great, great. I'm, I'm so proud of you guys being here because I think dental hygienists play an important role in the health of the dental department. So we have also a clinical trial, it's just gonna repeat itself the same information. Um, so with both keratinize and attached gingiva, non-attached gingiva, keratinized, non-keratinized. Unfortunately, the, all this study, we don't have any evidence that it's important for us around dental implant. But logically, we don't like that, right? We don't like tissue that's moving, mucosa that's moving. We don't like it if non keratinized We know we see more plaque on those patients with non keratinized tissue, right? But we the evidence is not there, at least in the old study. Thanks God, we have some new evidence. It's correlate bone loss by saying like, okay, we have more plaque, we have more inflammation. It must cause some bone loss for us. So we talk about that we want to do in the aesthetic zone, in my opinion, some type of tissue conversion. We want to get better result. It's one shot. You're going to place that implant in the aesthetic zone. If it's failed, you're not starting again from zero. You're starting minus 100. So this is one of the great tools. I, you know, I'm going to share with you some of the protocol I use or some of the procedure I use in my practice. This is lens burst and bichasho. This is socket seal surgery. You know, we're gonna take full thickness from the palate and we're gonna close um, the socket. We're gonna place the implant, or you can place the implant, place your membrane, place your benopolygraph material, your bone chips, and then you're gonna do the socket seal. And I love this concept, because remember what we talk about? We have a wound, we have opening inside the body. And what we want, the tissue in the mucosa, the skin wanna close the body as soon as possible. We're trying to tell the, the body, hey, don't worry, we already closed the body. We have a socket seal surgery. We have a tissue closed. Please just integrate and we'll get a good result. The body doesn't know, doesn't care if there's implant or not, right? So it's gonna heal. So I think this is a great procedure. You will get more keratinized tissue. You will have a better healing. And many times you will preserve the bone and you can get four millimeter thickness of this type of, because you have a double thickness. Now the problem with this protocol, that we gonna, we want this tissue to integrate and the tissue height for the gingiva around two to three millimeters. So the blood supply is gonna come from the side, but that's very limited. So we get some failures on those procedures. <laughs> so another publication, another protocols, and this is the same concept. With the part that's double thickness, okay, epithelium connective tissue, we're gonna seal the socket, okay? And we have also extra inlay part, and that's pure connective tissue. 
that we can get it as an interpositional. You can split thickness if you're comfortable doing split thickness and tunnel that toward the facial. Now you're getting a socket seal. You're going to close the body. You're going to tell the body, it's great. You are good. Don't worry. And you're going to get more thickness toward the facial, right? That's the desirable effect that we want to have. So more tissue on the facials, better you know, better result, less grayish area, I hope less dehiscence. We don't know anything about the buccal plate. I don't I couldn't find anything that would tell me if I do extraction and immediate placement, if that the bundle bone is gonna stay or it's gonna go. We don't have any evidence that's that bundle bone we can save or not. So thicker tissue is a great idea. So I started using this protocol. This is one of my patients. And what I use, the, in, the inlay part, the interpositional part, I use it for the facial and the lingual. So I'm getting more stability, and also I'm getting more blood supplies, right? So there's a great benefit from doing these procedures on your patient for socket seal procedures, okay? After immediate extraction of the tube. So this is, um, this is the desirable effect on, on the left hand side those that column and this is the different procedure that we can do and I'll show you some other procedures this connective tissue and also I took it further I did a connective tissue that I vascularized that I predicted from the palate and move it and rotate it to the facial then I did the same procedure that I harvest connective tissue keep it connected keep it vascularized rotate it pedicle it and tunnel it around the implant. And I'll show you some clinical cases. But also I like the combination graph. So I, um, I, I created this novel approach where I utilize a combination graph that's vascularized and rotated in doubles. And I just published this article in Wiley uh, clinical case report just, just last month. I have these articles in your package for your review. What's nice about this, art, uh, this article is it's been photographed step by step. So it's very easy to understand how we did the procedure step by step. I want to move on to the position of dental implant. Because also as a restorative and also as a surgeon, we want to understand where are we going to place the implant? Are we going to place the implant bone level, tissue level? Subcrystal. We have now a lot of dental implants that we place them subcrystally. And actually the drills longer than the implant itself, one millimeters. So it's designed to go subcrystal. So what the deal here, what the story? I think this is a nice study. A lot of dentists follow this and dental company too uh, that's manufactured dental implant by Herman. So with the rough smooth line he concluded it needs to be bone level. Makes sense, rough, you want interaction with the bone faster, this posterior integration. Soft, gingival levels, I know the hygienists love soft tissue, uh, uh, polish colors and polish abutment, right? Much easier to clean. Um, and the whole business, you know, I'm sure you guys are familiar with this famous type of implant. You can see the rough surface, then one millimeter is polish colors higher. Okay. So the the reason for why we have that one millimeter is higher than the bone because we have that connection and we don't want um, any kind of pumping effect from the connection and micro leakage from that pumping effect. So we're trying to put the gaps, the micro gaps of between abutment and implant away from the bone so we can preserve the bone. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so a whole companies did that. But I have a problem. Um, when I start to do immediate implant placement, extraction and immediate implant placement, which I'm a big fan of, and there is a reason why. Um, but I'm gonna focus on, on this concept. What are we gonna place the implant three-dimensionally, and I know you guys know facially you want to have enough thickness of bone, you want to have enough thickness 
toward the lingua and interproximal, you don't want to be close to the other teeth. But I'm talking vertically, because that I think the missing part is, I think is, we struggle to understand. But when I want to place implant in immediate uh, tooth extraction situation, the, the bone is kind of scalloped. The facial bone and interproximal bone are different height, correct? Am I wrong here? No, it's the bones are scalloped, right? It's follow the gum. So interproximally, the bone is higher. So if I place my implant um, bone level in immediate placement, I'm going to go with the facial, right? The facial bone. So I'm subcrystally automatically on the interproximal, right? I'm doing the math, correct? Yes. So that was struggle. So this is one of my patients. And here's, I placed the implant and I placed the final abutment in the same day. Her name is Maria, she's a great patient. And that's the picture, if you see the date, it's, I think, June 2016. And now I want to bring you this control, a randomized control trial, high level of evidence by Alina has been published just now, 2019. It's just been published. And they did this clinical trials, and they compared two groups, subcrystally half a millimeters and one millimeters and a half. And they couldn't find any difference. So if you place implant, your implant half a millimeter subcrystally, or if you place it two millimeters, there's no difference, okay? At, for the crystal bone level. So this is my patient here, Maria, and I did one abutment one time, immediate placement. I'll share the complete case with you guys in the end of the um, today. But you can see the follow up. You can see the bone. It's, it's on, it's, this is the bone on abutment level. Okay? This is 2017, 2018. We just seen her in, in, in 2018. Nice result on the bone, right? Is this good? I hope you guys like it. You know, because I was worried doing this in 2016. I, I'm not sure how much evidence I have. I have to, if I'm placing it um, bone level facially, automatically it's going to be subcrystal on the interproximals, right? And dental course don't, dental pathology course don't tell you this. I have to go all the way to Frankfurt to learn about this concept and get a Master of Science. So that's why, I, you know, this is part of my passion and my struggle doing uh, courses because everything is like a cookbook. Do this, get this implant, do that. But always I struggle because I want to understand why. Why this implant is superior? Why are we getting best, better result because we're paying more for this implant? Or they have something going on right for them. Okay. So, conical connection. I was excited about the conical connection because if I get like a cold welding between the abutment and the implant, I felt like I'm not going to have this problem with the micro gap and, and the toxin release from the micro gap. But actually, that turned out not true. Even on conical connection, we have a problem with endotoxin. And that been published in 2010. If you don't believe that, another study by Canulos, 2015 too. 40 uh, patient, different kind of uh, connection, um, none could prevent it micro leakage. So we do have a problem with the micro gap. So going back to that case, if I place my abutment and seal it, seal that micro, micro gap, and, and conical connection, fairly stable one, is that better? So this is butt joint type of connection. All these famous implants, so if you utilize those in your office, you see those in your office, I'm not going to make a lot of comments, but I want you to see the difference. This is done in University of Frankfurt. It's a type of radio videography. And, and I don't want to be here. That's a big gap. You see that if I can see it with my eyes, there is no problem for the bacteria to kind of pump in and out. I'm gonna have bone loss here for sure. So if you're utilizing this type of um, implant, your patient's gonna get bone loss and tissue problem for free. Yes, you're not gonna charge them for that. 
So we have to have understanding. And we don't know. Some of the good company, they have this, that, this connection. So is this as warriors as a dental team working with the patient? We got that privilege of serving our patient. And now, nowadays, our patient not, not so trustful. They don't give you second chance. Do they? I don't give the second chance. Sometimes I do. But if we can get it from the first time, for the sake of our patient and for our sake, it's a good idea. So again, different kind of connection. If you utilize this implant, I want you, if you utilize one implant or two or three, you should understand your implant well. So this is again, if, if, if we didn't get it right, and now we have some dehiscence, and you know, the gray is showing. Can we do connected tissue graft, vascularized tunnel, combination graft, all these nice procedures? One of them I publish. Is that gonna work? Anything more than two millimeter would fail. So if we have a tiny bit of grayish, it's work. If, if it's more than two millimeters, we know from literature different studies. 2008 to 2000, so old, 2010, and then it's been reinformed again, 2008. And those are good study. So we're not gonna get a better result by doing tissue, it's too late now. What are you gonna tell your patient? Remove the implant or start again? What are we gonna tell them? It's very hard. And it's not always about fault. We know what we know and what we don't know, we don't know. So let me introduce the soft tissue concept. And I published about this last year. This is, was my master thesis. And I worked over three years on this um, article. And I remember in 2014, there was a, a meeting for the guru in the Academy of Osteointegration. And they came up with the three challenges for us as a restorative insertions in dental team and patient. Vertical bone augmentation, very challenging. Also, we have a problem with papilla between implant, two implant, papilla, what is the papilla? Black triangle, common complaint. And also the gap, soft tissue gap between the transmucosal and the tissue. So my goal was, and I tried to, uh, my mentors speak German and you know, they have a different culture in Germany. And I was, you know, I, the good things it was in, in English, the Master of Science, but I speak with them and I tell them this, and then we speak with the shellers and say, no, no, you cannot write about this. Um, but in the end, they accepted this. And what I told them to convince them, I want to have a surface of my abutment that I can have a good seal between the tissue, the gum, and the titanium or the zirconium abutment or the material of your choice. So bacteria does not invade and cause periimplantitis. Because periimplantitis, that was the third challenge that the guru put out for us in the Academy of Osteo Integration around 2014. That was a problem. And unfortunately, I, I just, two years ago, I read an article that it says, now general dentists doing more work with dental implant, that's why we have a problem with more periimplantitis. I think that's very biased. And that's not good talking about other dentists. Right? Is that the problem? I think the problem, we just have a rougher surface now. Faster integration, but it's come with a price. Also, we place in more implant, because for me, I see a lot of implant done by specialists. Yeah. It's not who's placing it, it's how you place it. Did you understand what, what we did? Why we did it? Did the patient was well informed? Did you talk with your patient about the risk? Was your team supportive to you when failures happen? Because sometimes it's just biologically responded, we don't, we don't know why. 
And the more you know, you know it. We don't know it. The more you know, you, you understand how much you don't know. So I started with uh, my research. I started with 200 titles, 200 articles. And I also searched manually and I found another six articles. And then um, my, I, this is was my preliminary pool of 206 articles. After applying the inclusion and uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria, reading all this abs abstract for 200, 206 articles, you know, I don't know how is my wife kind of took that, and she was great and supportive. But that took a lot of time to read those abstract, and she's studying too. Um, so anyway, it was very hard, but. 16 articles that I kept, I utilized as a final, final, and I extracted the data from those. And I'm gonna share with you guys some of the findings. Well, first, um, I work with my mentors about um, if we want to achieve soft tissue seals, we want to prevent pre-implantites, we want to get a certain result. Let's see what's how is the tissue around natural tooth, and let's try to see if we can get to nature life. So we study the tissue, I study the tissue around the natural tooth, and the difference between the tissue around natural tooth and the tissue around transmucosal part of dental implant. And what we found, and there's a lot to study about this, and what's important things I found, we have less cells around dental implant. We have gap between the epitheliums and the connective tissue and the transmucosal abutment. We have um, less vascularity, if I didn't talk about this. We have less fibroblasts. We have collagen fibers that's more parallel to the transmucosal. Versus in, in the tooth, we have like sharpie fibers, is inserted perpendiculars, right? And it's functional, it's, it's resist chewing, resist forces. So we try to create the same things, and, or we, we not try to create, we search for factors that we can get the same result of soft tissue around dental implant. And this is a measurement, again, it's not about the implant, it's, you know, the measurement of the tissue is the same around different type of implant. This is, this is the slide because what we're missing around the implant, the peri ligaments um, space, and we don't, we don't get any blood supplies from that space. It's, it's, there's just bone. So, and that's how it's looked like around natural tooth. So, one of the things I utilize and I'm excited about, and I was disbelieving, I become a believer, utilizing PRF. Or if you use any, or your surgeon, or uh, you use any generation of type of platelet-rich um, growth factor, PRP, PRF, PRGF, all, all those are good for soft tissue healing. Okay? But w what we know too, that um, all platelet derivative growth factors can improve the vascularity. So that's why I'm interested in this, besides soft tissue healing. We can get PGF, growth factors from PRF or PRP and whatever, you, whatever kind of generation you use. Also, you can get hypoxia inducing factor and vascular endothelial growth factor. So those growth factors, those messenger can create more tissue for you, or I'm sorry, more vascularity of the tissue. Because the tissue that we have on the crest, on the ridge, usually are scar tissue. Very simple to use, it's very powerful. So this is another study by Berglund, 1991. Lack of vascular supplies in the tissue around dental implant compared to natural teeth. This is the collagen fi fibers here run parallel to the implant abutment complex. So that's not what we want. Same thing. Now, Spach published a lot, and I think it's we all as dentists, we own him a great deal. He 
published this beautiful result, histological study, but for the first time um, on, in this study, we have, he found that histological evidence of collagen fiber and certain perpendicular against the transmucosal part of the dental uh, abutment complex. So that's a great result. If we have a biocompatible titanium oxide surface, we can actually get perpendicular insertion. So that was a great finding. This is how the epithelium uh, in contact with dental abutment hemodesmosome. And this is the study, the histological evidence, and you can see that collagen fibers run perpendiculars. And that's very mm -hmm. nice. Uh, Schwarz also published, and he got different type of surface. He hydrophilic uh, changed the surface chemistry in energy of the abutment, and also again he has um, he done histological study, and also that turn out that hydrophilic surface, we can get the same type of result. We can get that uh, perpendicular insertion of the collagen fibers, which is great. That's what we want. We want to have a seal. And if we have that perpendicular insertion, we get seal. Also, he found that there is a gap between the hydrophobic type of abutment and the tissue around the abutment. And this is another histological, this is from Schwarz study. This is another study which Klaus published in 2011. And he used a rat, and he placed a specimen that's hydrophilic surface parallel underneath the skin. And what he found, also hydrophilic nanocrystallized diamond type of specimen. And he found, which is was very interesting here to me, that he found more cells and more blood supply around the hydrophilic specimen. So that's great. So we hydrophilic will give us more blood supplies around um, the titanium. We can get more cells and we get collision info. That sounds like a nat nature like. Mm -hmm. So I was interested in this a lot. So this is, I think you, you all guys heard about this, and I think this is a great. Another study by Navis AL published about, you, you guys heard about BioHorizon and laser lock implant. Now laser lock, um, a blade surface, been applied to dental abutment. If you work with a surgeon or if you place BioHorizon, you might know about this. But they have this micro uh, channels of eight micron height roughness between the mountain and the valley. And they got a great result too. They have a great seals, and they have perpendicular insertion. Okay? Then they apply that first to the implant. They get a great result on the bone and integration. Then even if they apply it in the uh, on the abutment as well, so you can utilize it on the abutment. Eagle Hart published another study, but he took it next level. He disconnect the abutment. He placed the abutment again. He did the same study again, the same research research, same histological study, he found if you disconnect and reconnect, you lose that attachment. It's you impair. But that's what we do. Wait a minute, right? We place a healing abutment, we take the healing abutment, we put impression coping, we throw it out, we put temporary dental abutment, we throw it out. Every time, you know, saliva gets in the sand, and I don't know. Um, but that's what we do, so that's not helpful. Same thing for hydrophilic, too. So you put the up, you know, helium abutment cover screw first, second stage surgery. This is not efficient. But we have to, sometimes we don't have choice. We have to use all these stuffs. So this is again a surgical study. I think I like this slide because you can see the difference between the peroral fibers and the functional oriented fiber. And you can see the laser micro group. You can see that laser lock, a bladed surface, that gray surface on the abutment. That rough, that eight micron. But you can see here's the collagen fiber insertion to that um, laser lock type of, or laser ablated micro channel. Actually, I'm very happy that we have the abutment available commercial, commercially for us to use that we can get 
some type of insertion functional fibers around dental implants. But, but my concern is, even my good patient with good oral hygiene, life is up and down, and they get some time in a situation where it's family emergency, they get sick, they get something going on in their life, and they ignore their hygiene. So my concern is that that eighth micron, that's very rough. I know probably the hygienists will agree with me. Rough surface on dental abutment, hard to control the plaque, hard to clean. So if I have that functional insertion, great. Then if I lost that connection, I'm back to micro gap, that surface of the abutment is not gonna get clean. We're violating the threshold of 0 0.3, 0 0.4 micron. When you violate that, you get affinity of microorganism. But it's the same. If you want to get affinity to cells, you're gonna get affinity to microorganism. So it's struggle and dilemma. So I'm not sure if I want to use this type of abutment um, on my patient. And if I want to use it, I want to be very careful. But I want to go back to also, what about hydrophilic? If I disconnect, I'm gonna lose the same, I'm gonna lose the, the connection again. I'm gonna tear that insertion. So think about the fibrins and the collagen inserted into the healing abutment, then I'm gonna remove the abutment, I'm gonna tear it. Now I have an opening in the body. Remember what skin wanna do, the epithelium? Wanna epithelialize, wanna create junctional epithelium. So that attachment is gonna go. The connective tissue is gonna shrink down. The epithelium is gonna win that fight. So uh, my conclusion was, this is what I want um, out of my research. I want biocompatible surface that's clean. <coughs> okay. Because dental abutment we get from the manufacturers is non-sterile. And if you sterilize that abutment, it's not good. It's, you're going to change the surface chemistry. Actually, you're going to get inhibition of collagen fibers. Okay, So I want that abutment to be clean, biocompatible, and I don't, I want to prevent any connect, disconnect. So that's lead me to one abutment, one time concept. And that's very hard, hard concept, concept that you need, you need a primary stability. Um, and it's not always applied. Many times we have to do some bone graft and it's not that easy. But when you can, if you can prevent, um, connect, disconnect, that would be great. So this is, I work with a, one of the company in Silicon Valley, um, and we study the abutment surface. The abutment surface and the implant surface, this is hydrophilic. I'm sorry, hydrophobic. And you can see when it's hydrophobic, it's like, don't want to mix. It's hating the water. You see it, that drop? Now think about that drop of water as a cell. Is the cell wanna touch the implant? Wanna interact? Wanna have an interface with it? No. Now, now we change the surface chemistry and energy. Now this surface is super hydrophilic. Now you can see the difference. And I'm sure you guys, um, heard about Stroman SL type of surface, it's called hydrophilic, uh, and you can get um, faster healing, but we don't have anything on the abutment. So how we can utilize the abutment and make it hydrophilic? But you can see the difference. So anyway, this company is, and, and, you know, I, I think I call like a 20 company, only one company was company was working, willing to work with me, because they work in big indus industry in, in Silicon Valley, and, and who are you that does to kind of do something for you? But this company worked with me, and they made me like a small machine in my office. I can change the surface of the abutment in the implant to hydrophilic. Isn't that great? And I use it on every patient. I'm trying even, you can see that surface hydrophilic, and it didn't come with water. We change that surface, 
in my office, I didn't have to pay extra $150 to get the difference between Stroman, hydrophobic, hydrophobic and hydrophilic. I do it here in my practice. And I can pass that statement for my patient. Do you see how is the blood coming out on the thread of the implant? That's nice, right? I don't only use it on um, on my implant. I, the good things I can implement what I what I publish. I can practice what I preach in my practice for for our small town that I love and I love every patient that's come and enters my doors. I love everyone who come and enter my doors. So, so, so the students are so yes. you chemically treat your implants or before, I mean? Yes, so you have two ways you can change the surface uh, chemistry in energy. Um, we don't utilize any material to add on the abutment. I use ultraviolet light in plasma to irradiate the surface. And that's how I change it. So I change the contact angle. I decrease the contact angles by improving the energy. So you know what's the plasma state of the matter? So kind of like the sun, the power of the sun in the palm of your hand. All the sun is plasma. Definitely I don't have nuclear reaction here right. or anything like that. I don't have a fusion, a hydrogen fusion manufacturer here. No, what we do is just the gas. We, we apply um, electrical current to the gas, the, the room, room gas, or you can use oxygen, whatever gas you want. And then you can separate the electron and protons and they will kind of bombard the implant surface and um, decrease the contact angle and increase the energy of the surface. It's not hot, it's not, it's not hot. It's, it's tested, I'm not the first one using it. Right. Um, it's been used in Italy now, it's been used in Germany. Sure. There's companies manufactured from Germany, but I decided to get it from Silicon Valley. The technology's out there, right. just to kind of get it to us in the dental field. And I think we are just such a small business, and I offer my help, but maybe someday we will have it in the same. But I know if you want to have that in your office, I'll be happy to help and get you the contact information. Okay. So now is, this, is on, um, this is on the left. I utilize healing abutment okay, um, on a second stage surgery. Now I remove it. And this is how is the surface look like. Now when it's pink, it's epithelium. When it's bleeding, the, yeah. So uh, it's, so when I have a bleeding, that's a good thing. That's interaction between the transmucosal abutment. And now I tear that when I remove the healing abutment. But I wanna see with my eyes, because I don't believe in, unless I see it, and seeing is believing. I, the same patient, my patient Isaac, we did it again. Now is, we took the impression, everything. Um, now I put um, the healing abutment after decontamination and irradiation, make that surface hydrophilic again, and then I place it, okay? This is on the day of delivery of the final crown, it's 31, that's all the way in the back. You can see the epithelium is grow, that pink part. But I still have some attachment. Actually, you can see the tear in this point. I think my laser is not going to shine on a, on a plasma TV, but can you see the tear of the tissue? So you can still get some type of attachment, but it's not the same like the first one. If I keep my abutment, I will have that good seal, but I have to only utilize one abutment. So there is um, there's a company, Nobel, came out now with the transmucosal part uh, to, um, it's called one on all or something. So you when you place the implant, you put that transmucosal part, then you restore on a tissue level. So that part is not gonna be disturbed anymore. So that's, 
this is not something from you know just me telling you it's a whole industry working on to come this is the future so if the company picking up a concept from literature and start to manufacture and they want to sell they have a good reason so this is the future because we know osteo integration we are successful the problem is soft tissue integration then we kind of hey we blame our hygienist we send our patient to the hygienist again and again fix it for us do your magic my question to you, Doc, is yes. why do you think the very first time you have a more attachment than the second time? Because the uh, disconnect and reconnect. So when I disconnect the first time, I tear that. I open the wound again. Right. Then if the epithelium is going to start to grow and uh, there's proliferation is going to happen. It's just a wound healing. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you try to put a something hydrophobic and see if there's no attachment at all? Um, if you have, you will get some attachment, not the same like, because we have a Schwab study on the uh, titanium oxide, you get attachment. Actually look at your, if you're placing implant and placing the abutment right away, if you have a good stability and you decided to go and place the healing abutment and the tissue heal nicely and, and you, if you remove your healing abutment and you see bleeding, that's a good thing. Not the bleeding like it's bleeding, Right. Okay, and you drown it in the blood. If you see it red, you have attachment. But the problem, you remove it now, it's gone, and it's not going to come back. Yeah, that was my question. How come the, how did you create it in the first place, and how come it's not coming back again? Since, you know, you, you had an open flap done, you put an immediate implant, you know, and you put a, a blood, in, healing blood in there, so the attachment appeared from somewhere, right? So how come it's not going to appear the second time again? Yes. Yes. Well, it's, I am. But I'm sorry. We know it's not going to. It's going to yeah. come back again. Sure, so it's gone. But if you have hydrophilic surface, all what I'm trying when I try it, I found some attachment. I show you a picture. Right. Sorry, but nice. remember, time also play a role because you tear that wound again, right? We have an open wound. You want to take your impression, copy and place it, take your impression, do your scan if you're doing digital, um, decontaminate your abutment, right? And don't allow saliva to get in, keep the area clean, and change the surface chemistry and energy, make it hydrophilic, put it back, and that's what we did here for Isaac. Sound like we were faster than the, the epithelium, because all that done within 15, 20 minutes, but Yes, if it's gonna, the patient's gonna be for hours, and you know, saliva so gets in, that attachment is gone, gone for good. Thank you. Did they answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Thank you. So you know, I strive for excellence, and we got to the clinic part. So I promise you, this is your your weekend's gonna start soon. <laughs> so um, all what I'm trying to say that we have also, beside everything I. We, we talk about that we have to treat the abutment the same way like we treat the implant. So when we when we doing the surgery, we all good and we have the drapes and we disinfect all the surface, everything clean, no saliva attached to the implant. I hope before it's kind of go and we get osteointegration. Now is when it's come to the abutment. The abutment is coming from the lab. We don't know what's happened from hand to hand. It's fall on the floor, oh, put some alcohol on it, clean it. That's not gonna work. Actually, there are some studies been published that some of the peri-implantitis type of bacteria or microorganism, it exists on our skin too. So it's manipulation of us touching the implant with our hands. So I know it's, it's very hard. <coughs> I wish somebody can create like something to hold the button for me and I'm going to number 15 and with the cover screw and this is when I wish my hand is smaller. It's the only time I wish when my hand is small and I'm going to go to the patient's throat and the implant place a little bit toward the mesial. You have to go a little bit further and what is my shorter driver? <coughs> oh, it's not ready doctors, we only have a long one. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs>
And now is the button is gonna go right away like magnetic and it's gonna oop, right into place. So it is not the easy thing. I'm not saying this is easy, but let's see if we can do it on patients, right? Let's see if we can implement what we learn. Because that's the goal. There is I'm not spending my time just studying for just, you know. We have to use this and to help our patient. And we want to help them because we are here in Visalia in, in our, you know, this county. We want to help our patient here, you know. So this is my patient, Carlos. He's a great patient. He's been with me for, I don't know, 10 years. So number eight, fail. Okay. Oh. Do you see the tissue level? That's higher than number nine. Okay. So I already have problem. Do we have problem here? Okay. So this is how I practice or I used to practice. I still do that as you know when it's indicated, but, but I'll show you how I switch the way I think. So connective tissue graft, socket preservation, just the normal stuff that you guys do every day. It's healed. Okay, let me say here, let me pause and say I'm great at this. <laughs> what did I do different? Nothing. It's the biological response. Patient healed good. I didn't do anything, guys. I did every dentist do the same. If you are a specialist or general dentist, in the aesthetic zone, you do tissue graft and you do soft preservation procedure. I know you guys all assessed, you've seen it, you know it, you read it. Okay. But that's not my point. Okay, so I want to have this protocol efficient. So I did the papilla sparing incision. I placed my implant. Okay. High torque. Great. Some PRF, some I collected the bone. I placed temporary abutment. I did immediate provisionalization. Okay? And you can see that this is temporary. You can see the tissue saying, like, who's that? Things on the top of me. Okay? But you know, it's healed, and you can see some bleeding points. Just a rubber dam and resin, nothing special. You get that bleeding point the first time. Okay, if it's clean surface and biocompatible. Okay. If you guys remember when we used to do those of eight pontic with the bridges, you get to bleed and you remove this bridge after 10 years sometime, and you see those of eight pontic bridgemen while, you can see that bleeding surface. You have attachment underneath. And don't tell me patient was cleaning underneath that bridge and using threaders and going through it. I don't, I don't think, so. you know, if they done it twice in a year, it's good. <laughs> You'll be happy, yeah. But that bleeding and that bridge survives with that Ovid bond because we have some seal. So we did the normal stuff and, you know, cementation. So I used some um, quick jig with Biped uh, materials inside, then I'm going to get a cement, and the thickness of the cement is going to be the amount of shrinkage. That's how I control my cement thickness. Or one of the protocol. Oh, let me go back. Do you see the, um, the abutment implant level? I got bone loss. Do you guys remember? I placed it to crystal, crystal level. Now I have bone loss. Yeah. I don't? You can see it? Okay. Well, I think this is, can you read that date? This is 2015. I just seen um, Carlos. May 2nd, 2019. Now is my crystal bone is the same level. What's happened? Is the bone grow? It did in this case. Do I know? I don't know. It's biological response. My patients heal well. This is the picture we just took in May. Nice result. Okay, but 
maybe a little bit lucky. Great patience, good tissue. I don't know. I don't have explanation. Another patient is more complex. Use that partial. Literally, the partial is and you know, press the tissue and you get great bone loss. Measure release and pretty awesome. Hard thing, you know, bone block. Two fixation screw, insulting the bone to get osteogenic cell. Closures. Look at the tissue. It's healed, right? Look at the block bone. It's bleeding. It's, it's alive and well. Okay, we place the implant now. High torque again. Now this is the connective tissue. I kept it attached and to the interior so I can get supply. Then I tunnel it and I utilize it again on temporary abutment. Why is it on temporary abutment? I didn't know I can place final abutment. Because if I place final abutment, how I'm gonna restore it? I'm gonna pack a cord and get the seal, then pack a cord, uh, pack cord, maybe four cord, five cord, and hopefully I get enough to pick up the margin piece. I didn't know better. Again, this is abutment replica to control the cement. I don't want any cement underneath that, right? It's still bleeding. You want cement? Where's my hygienist? Do you want cement underneath the implant? No. Okay, but you have, we have to do some steps to prevent that. Healing. Nice porcelain work before and after. You know, I got that um, by coron coronary advancing the club. I got the full coverage on the canine. That was a nice bonus, right? Um, wasn't very happy with the tissue. What should I do? Nothing. I'm just gonna allow complete maturation. Remember what I told you guys in early? If you trust that you have you did the right things, you have the connective to show the read. It's gonna work, it's gonna take time. And you can see here, the thing, epithelialized and keratinized. Okay, it's a nice result. But how I can practice here when I don't have anything? No bone, nothing, very thin bone. Yeah, I cannot do one abutment one time here, can I? I have to build that bone, I cannot do any soft tissue management. Maybe I can do some, you know, grafting, maybe some tissue, connective tissue graft, but oh. We have to do this. We have to build the bone first. Because if we don't have the bone, we cannot place the implant. It's not possible. So I'm not we cannot still practice in the future. We have to practice in the present. So tissue management. Provisionals, yeah, nice porcelain work. But I'm lucky because the patient was happy. But look what is the tissue. It's if the patient have a high smile line, not well informed, we have a problem, right? But patient well informed, she was very happy. Do you do two surgeries? Over there, did you do a tissue surgery second time also? I think I did. What you see here you was, I think, the titanium, titanium, titanium mesh. Mesh you have when you remove, did you do another one? Another? Can you go back on this? Every side? time, I'm gonna open a flap, expose the bone. I'm gonna put some bone in there. Every and time. And you put a member, right? Reserve bone. Yes. Member so every time you're gonna expose the the bone, you're gonna get bone loss. So at least I'll place like a veneer bone. So every time you're gonna open those big flaps, you're gonna get bone loss automatically. So every time I'm gonna open, or I have to open, I don't open because I want you, not because I wanna show how much bone I did, right? And I say, hey. But, um, but you have to put some bone. At least that's how I practice. 
So this is, I decided to change the way I practice. Or I try. There's, I have a couple of cases, I think nine cases. It's not easy, but it's doable. Even with, with me, with my small office, but I have a great team too. They are very supportive. I know they work on every cases of these, right? You crystal probably remember all of them, right? So I utilize uh, here, I wanted to do the one abutment one concept. I didn't have hydrophilic surface then. I didn't have that machine. I only have it for a year and a half. Um, but at least I said, okay, I want to do immediate placement. I want to do one abutment one time. Immediate professionalization, no loading. No loading. Yeah. Truth in one day, that does not mean loading. That does not mean like bending iron with your teeth. Okay, so yes, when you, you know, you utilize the PA, PA, so you want to do right atraumatic extraction. And when you want to do something, everything go wrong, <laughs> right? Tooth came out in pieces, but hey, I think the surgery took less than, placed the implant less than the extraction. Um, but the tooth is out, we clean it, we place that hydrophilic implant. I didn't have the machine to change it, but at least I would say, hey, I want hydrophilic implant because I want to reduce the risk. I placed the final abutment. This is same x-ray. This is Maria. If you guys remember, I placed the implant slap crystalline. How are you, doctor? Good to have you. So this is one. Up, uh, this is abutment level uh, impression coping. And I did the jig here, veneer grafting. You do all the things. We put PRF and we place we place the provisional. So think about it in the biology, biological response of the body. The socket is sealed. The body is, does not need to do anything, right? Okay. We place PRF, better, better healing. We place one abutment, so I'm gonna have interaction between the collagen on abutment level, not on the bone level, right? I'm gonna have that insertion of collagen fibers against my abutment. I'm gonna have more cells, at least around my implant, okay? So that, I think that was Friday. And this is how it looks on Monday. That's nice, right? I must done something right here to have that normal response of the tissue. And I show you guys over 2016, 2017, 2018, bone level follow-up. So we have to use an anatomical shape type of tube. You have to have the abutment deep down a little bit, two millimeters, one millimeter and a half, because you have to build that immersion profiles. But what's root is gonna be root, what's crown is gonna be crown. But look at that tissue. And it's look the same. I promise you, it's look the same. I see Maria's, it didn't change. So I wanna do that more. So this is my patient, Monica. So um, this is more documented case, so you can, I want you to know how we utilize the one abutment, one time concept, because that abutment is gonna go in there, it's not gonna come out, we're not gonna back forward or anything. So we already have a master models, okay, at this level. Okay. We took impression, we're gonna open a flap, we're gonna place the implant, we're gonna get high torque, it's important to have primary stability, Now you're gonna place impression coping, you're gonna use low shrinkage materials of your choice. And I'm gonna do, this is implant level impression coping. So I'm gonna place on the first tooth a little bit of material. I'm gonna allow that to shrink. I'm gonna move my tips to the other tooth. I'm gonna place a little bit. Okay. I'm gonna allow that to shrink. I'm gonna put a little bit on the implant and I'm gonna connect everything. So if you can change the tip and start again, allow that to shrink completely, you get less shrinkage more accuracy. You're gonna connect implant replica. Now you're gonna utilize that jig on the master models. And what you're gonna do, you're gonna hollow that models. And you're gonna draw the tissue where you want. Right? 
I already started with a lot of tissue. So I know I can get the result I want. This is just, I use um, resin pattern to fixate the implant replica to the bottom of the master model. Just a small jig, thermoplastic material to, this is my abutment. I'm gonna customize it, gonna keep it clean, gonna fabricate the temporary, I'm gonna place the temporary, the tissue's gonna heal, this is the final result. It's a nice tissue. So from the biological point of view, we have a good response. If we know how to work with the body, we're gonna get a good heal. So I think what's important for me is that we all young, and if we want to get the wisdom, <coughs> we don't have to get old. We can just be in your chair. That's my favorite chairs, educations. So I want you all to be proud of being here today on a Friday night. I'm impressed. So I know all of you guys successful, and a lot of people see that top part. But I want to tell you that I know about the risk you take, the failures, the doubt, the criticism that you receive, sometimes from very close people to you, the discipline that you demonstrate, the sacrifice that you give, given, the rejection that you receive, the late night study, the hard work you've done, and that's who you are, the success that we see. Thank you guys, have a great Memorial's weekend, and thank you for being here. I will stick around for any question or any concern.